I'm going to talk about three topics, actually. Um, I'm going to talk about insight. I'm going to talk about respect for evidence. And I'm going to talk about social responsibility and fear together. Okay? And, and there's a reason why I speak. Uh, I've chosen these three to talk about five minutes each, hopefully. And then we can take questions afterwards. And the reason is that I don't think there is um, anything that is completely objective. And finding the truth in any piece of information and presenting it in a way that is going to be of some utility to, to the people for whom it is intended is a challenge that many of us face. Now, before I became a journalist, I worked on the other side of the fence in that for, 14, for 15 years, I worked in corporate communications uh, for Volkswagen and then for Extrata as well. So one of the things that you work with in all that time is manipulation of information, basically. And you take uh, the opaque and you try and make it obvious. You take the absolutely outrageous, you try and make it normal. And you take the normal and you make it sound outrageous in the case of your opponent in business. That is what I did. How does a journalist see through all of that and report what they should? There's a big elephant in the room. There are two big elephants in the room in sifting through information. One is your own insight. And you can't have insight if you don't feed your mind. You're not sufficiently knowledgeable. You don't read, you don't talk to people, and most importantly, you're prejudiced. Because when you talk to people, they tell you things which you might not necessarily be ready to hear. Right? So throughout our lives, when you're born, you're born believing nothing. Right? In fact, kids, when in their first few months, the idea of permanence doesn't exist. So if the parent, in fact, in the first couple of weeks, if the mother or the dad leaves the room, they stop existing, seriously, until they come back again. And then over time, this character keeps coming back, and there are certain associations with this character. So in the case of the mother, there's eating that happens when the mother is here, and then there's that association with the mother, and then with the father, and so on and so forth. So you brought up believing nothing. Everything that you know, there is nothing biological about it. You've been taught, and you've been taught to interpret information in a particular way, and that informs your insight. The battle for every human being, in particular somebody who's a journalist, is fighting what you've been taught. On two, is fighting two things. One, you need to fight against yourself so that you interpret the information in as scholarly a manner as possible. And secondly, that you are able to challenge your own prejudices and what you've been taught so that you can have the right level of insight so that you can inform people properly. So <coughs> I'm going to mention two cases which are currently topical. One, there is the Competitions Commission settlement with the construction industry where there's been a settlement. We're going to have a discussion about whether people think it is too little or too much later on. That is one. Um, the second case... Uh, pertains to, if you, if you take an interest in it, uh, Edward Snowden, the whistleblower, right? Is he a good guy or is he a bad guy? Now, I'm going to read a passage. Um, one thing I'd recommend if you're a journalist, this has helped me a lot in life, is to try and read philosophy if you can. Uh, there is a dense philosophy, there is the easy philosophy. I like Bertrand Russell. He's dead now. He lived until he was almost 100. But he said things almost 100 years ago which are still relevant today. And he reads like a column, basically. So this is from a book called Education and the Social Order. It's on Kindle. And you can also get it at very few bookshops as a book. So, or you can order it from Kalahari. It's also available on Amazon. And I'm going to read this. And this is the only thing I'm going to read. I'm not going to read anything else. This was in 1926. He says, Throughout the Western world, boys and girls are taught that their most important social loyalty is to the state of which they are citizens, and that their duty to the state is to act as its government may direct. Lest they should question this doctrine, they are taught false history, false politics, false economics. They are informed of the misdeeds of foreign states, but not of the misdeeds of their own state. They are led to suppose that all the wars in which their own state has engaged are wars of defense, while the wars of foreign states are wars of aggression. They are taught to believe that when, contrary to expectation, their own country does conquer some foreign country, it does so in order to spread civilization or the light of the gospel or a lofty moral tome 
or prohibition or something else which is equally noble. They are taught to believe that foreign nations have no moral standards. And as the British National Anthem asserts, that it is the duty of providence to frustrate the Navy tricks, a duty in which providence will not disdain to employ us as its instruments. Right. And this is what happens. So Edward Snowden is a bad guy. This morning on 702, a lady called Leslie called and uh, complained bitterly that this whole construction settlement uh, is much ado about nothing because these guys built those, uh, whatever they're supposed to build, the World Cup stadium. We had fun. We enjoyed the World Cup. So what is the complaint? They just got together, had a discussion about how much they're going to charge, and then they charged a price. It's business. What is wrong with that? Right? So how does this connect to journalism? Now, I'll give you an instance that happened to me in my previous life. I get a call from a journalist who's now a friend, and uh, he's heard that... <laughs> he's, no, this is what used to happen. This is what used to happen. This is what I used to This is how I used to do my job. If a journalist is doing a story on anything, and they feel that I can help them, I would. Obviously, I wouldn't get quoted or anything like that, but to the extent that they need insights, they need sources of information and that sort of thing, I would provide it to them, right? So that's how I worked. So this guy called me, and what had happened is that there's a gold mining company, a junior gold mining company, that was up for sale, and there were your traditional bidders for it. And then there was this interloper from nowhere who came in and made an offer which beat the other three that were already on the scene. And now he's suspicious as to, like, who the hell is this guy? This guy is black, by the way. Who the hell is this guy? His father is a politician. So who's this guy? So in his, I could tell that already he had somewhat decided that there was corruption involved, right? Here's the thing. So I'm going to talk about these topics interchangeably, by the way, so I'm not going to move from one to the other. So here's the thing. You need to respect the evidence. I cannot make a claim for which I have no evidence yet, right? I need to stop myself at that very moment when I say, ooh, I think this is corrupt, and you ask yourself why do I think it is corrupt? Because what Bertrand Russell talks about here that you've been taught consciously and subconsciously, start controlling your mind because well, you start seeing certain characters, so it's a white person, they've got to be racist, it's a black guy, it's got to be corrupt, especially if there's a politician involved and this kind of thing. When you don't have the evidence, it doesn't exist. So you move from a premise that I actually don't know, I want to find out about this guy, understand why they want to bind to this company, why they're paying what they're paying, where are they getting the money, and my first source of information, to the extent that this is possible, is this guy. And then what do I do? I go and check all of this out. Does it check out? And what does the evidence tell me? And here's the challenge for what you've been taught. Am I prepared to go against my own prejudice if the e evidence points me in a different direction? How difficult is it for me to say something that I am not inclined to say because the evidence points me in that direction? Or am I prepared to say I can't conclude either way because, because, because I can't... <laughs> There is insufficient evidence either way, but certainly this is interesting and it warrants a further look or whatever the case might be. Or am I prepared when the evidence tells me that the person that I instinctively trusted because they look like my high school headmaster that I, that, that I admired so much, in many ways this person is like my dad or like my uncle and so on and so forth, and somebody tells you, actually that guy is corrupt would you be moved to investigate it in the same way that somebody had told you something about the Guptas? So th that is the fear part of it, and that is the social responsibility <coughs> part of the discussion. Are we, are we prepared to do that? So when you're dealing with something like financial writing, writing on the economy, which for most people is really, really opaque, you've got a further battle, which is to simplify all of this and make it relevant to the person that's reading. Because I think there's a tendency to write things for ourselves. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's my biggest problem. I often have to leave my opinion pieces and let them stew because when I read them again, I realize I was writing for myself and other people like me. And the people that I should be reaching 
it's probably going to go right over, or it's not going to sound relevant, and this kind of thing. So, but of course, you work with pressure of deadline and other things. So you have to be you have to be quick, which is why the insight is important. So let me go to a different example. In company X, there is a new chief executive. He or she, well, engages in some bloodletting, and <coughs> five people are culled because they were supposedly useless, which may or may not be true, you don't know. This is what I've seen. So Chief Executive A comes in, they call some people, and, and off they go. And you know this person has asserted their authority, and so on and so forth. This sounds impressive over here, but they may also be narcissistic, because among those five people, three were useless, and two were actually assertive, and were likely going to challenge them. So that's the insight. Do you look into that at all? So has the company lost a vital asset in executive A or B as a result? And we generally hardly look at that. Let me make another example. Michael Jordan at FNB, he's leaving at the end of this year, right? If FNB is to decline over the next year, this guy that's coming in is going to take the fall, right? The seeds of decline in most companies are planted and germinate next before the company reaches the, the the crest of its rise because it starts believing that all it has to do to succeed is to show up and anything we do tends to money so i've watched fnb over the last couple of years going to e everything that's got nothing to do with banking right and this is wonderful michael dunn is on twitter and all the rest of it so what's going to happen at some point because your focus gets diverted. I'm not saying this is what's going to happen for sure, but I'm saying this is a theory worth exploring, right? But, but I'm likely to explore it because Michael Jordan is the Steve Jobs of banking in South Africa. I mean, he's always right. How can he be wrong, right? So they do everything now that has got little to do with banking because there is some link with banking. And then two years down the line, they realize, well, our attention is so much of our attention has been taken over by the non-banking stuff that we're not doing the banking really, really well. And actually, for the last two years, APSA has been plugging away, trying to do the right things and getting them right. So what you left with is a brand with excellent advertising and excellent gadgets and all of these things and very little on your core banking. So this is what happens. A set of results gets released and now I did this over here for years, right? So what you do is you take the really good stuff and you amplify it and you use jargon and that kind of thing and you take the stuff that is core, that really actually is important for shareholders and is important for customers and you bury it in chapter 7 of the annual report and of the presentation. You put one slide up and then you've got a really good chief executive who's an orator. Um, they can give a really good speech and impress everyone and they and become especially funny around the dangerous stuff and everybody forgets and you guys go and write and you write glowing report. What, what happens is that you become an accomplice in misleading shareholders and customers without realizing because you don't have the insight, you, don't have in, you haven't informed yourself and you've shown without knowing very little respect for evidence because you have not and you've allowed your prejudices and I guess celebrate to inform how you're going to approach the story. So this is what we used to do. We used to have uh, questions and answers. Uh, whenever well, there was something big, either we're taking over a company, buying an asset, selling an asset, results and so on. This thing goes on for pages and pages, 35, 40 pages, right? And guys who do your job would only ask questions worth one page out of that. Consistently, consistently, with obvious stuff. That has been in analyst reports for the last two to three years. And it's got to a point where somebody should start asking questions. I know Dina is looking at me funny uh, because I dealt with it. Um, but because that is what happened. And sometimes you just cannot believe how much people can't see the obvious. You put that question, your first five questions, which are your most lethal questions, you, nobody asks them at all. And then eventually you forget about the Q&A because nobody's ever going to ask them, ever. And then that chief executive leaves. And, and this happens in all companies, in all industries. So I'm not talking specifically about my ex-employer. That chief executive leaves. He's a hero. 
the next guy comes, inherits a mess. The last thing I want to talk about is what financial results tell you. I don't know if any of you have done management accounting. Right. Management accounting tells you about behavior. It will tell you how the governance is, management accounting and management finance, basically. It will tell you about the decision making in this company, right? It will tell you to the, the extent to which they do proper due diligence or not, right? And so the story tells a lot. Now, what I've seen very few journalists do, financial journalists, they look at the results on a quarterly basis, like the last few quarters, and they only look at last year, and that's it. And they don't look at the last two years in the same level of detail. Maybe not for today, results day, but for an opinion piece on the weekend or next week or whatever the case might be. And what does it tell you about the pattern of behavior? So this is what I'll tell you. A company whose boss is narcissistic and ego-driven, when it's facing an internal challenge where they need to grow organically, improve efficiencies and that sort of thing, they'll buy an asset, right? And what might happen over the two years is that maybe the FD or the chief financial officer leaves, right? Because that is the guy who understands the soft underbelly of the business. And they think, well, we can't keep spending money like this. This is where we're hemorrhaging money. We're not arresting that problem. We're splurging money on an asset that's being run well by someone else. We're bringing it into this portfolio so that we can also run it to the ground. But for the next six to 12 months, will show good money, shareholders will be happy because they're all short termists in their thinking. But their pension funds and other people are in there for the long term and there's going to be a bloodbath in four years time, right? We don't talk about it. And we'll blame the guy who's come in and found the mess before it, it was revealed and so on. So, but all of that needs that you challenge your own prejudices. Are you likely to believe certain people over others for absolutely no reason at all other than that you like them, they look like somebody you like, or they said something that you've liked before? That is the first thing. The second thing is, do we have respect for evidence? If I don't have the evidence, am I diligent about going to find it? If I find it, am I prepared for that evidence to sway what I already believed before if it points me in a different direction? And most importantly, Am I prepared to be as diligent in chasing that angle of the story so that the truth is known? And at what point do I allow fear and so on to, to affect me? Of course, there are other moral problems about, um, about whether when you reveal certain things, let me give an example. If the Competitions Commission had fined these companies, uh, I don't know, let's say three billion rand each, well, the government has a problem. Those people might lose jobs. So sometimes in life you have to take really wretched decisions which you don't like, but, but I don't think in the case of journalists that really arises that much. Anyway, I'll stop and take questions or comments.